The Emir of Qatar says it's time to end the Gulf dispute while remaining defiant that his nation would not be forced into the demands of the four blockading countries. So how does the region move forward nearly two months into this Gulf crisis? This is Inside Story. Hello there, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. Seven weeks into this Gulf crisis, and what you may have noticed is that no leader of any of the countries involved has spoken publicly about it. It's been left to diplomats and foreign ministers. That is until Friday night, 10 p.m. it was here in Doha, when the Emir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, addressed his nation. He said, quote, Qatar is fighting terrorism not to please others, but because it believes in the mission. Defiant words after nearly two months of accusations, demands and negotiations. The Emir thanked the resilience and combative spirit displayed by his countrymen for pushing back against the blockade by Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain and Egypt. And despite it still being in place and diplomacy moving slowly, Sheikh Tamim said Qatar had passed the test. It was a 17-minute address, and the Emir also called for negotiations with the four countries, but he said any resolution must respect Qatar's sovereignty. We are open to dialogue to iron out all the pending issues, not only for the benefits of our peoples and governments, but also to spare the region the pointless efforts to dissipate our gains. Any resolution must be based on two principles. One, to be based on the mutual respect of our sovereignty and will, Second, it cannot be phrased in a way of dictation or orders. Yet, collective and mutual undertakings, obligatory and binding on all sides, without exception. OK, so let's get into it with our panel now. Joining us from Berlin, Sheikh Saud bin Abdurrahman Al Thani, who is the Qatari ambassador to Germany. In London is Andreas Krieg, assistant professor at the Defence Studies Department at King's College London. And joining me here in Doha, Samar Shahata an associate professor with the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. Gentlemen, thank you all of you for joining us today. Sheikh Saud, if I can start with you. Why did the Emir choose to speak now? Seven weeks into the crisis, as I've said, nothing's really changed at all. And we've been waiting to hear from someone. So why now? Well, um, I think um, the speech of His Highness, which came uh, yesterday, uh, it shows uh, first the, the wisdom that need to be now on the table. And after, you know, the allegation and, the, you know, the hacking of the, you know, the news agency and all the allegation, because it started from all of that. I think the speech of His Highness want first to thank the people, the people on, of Qatar, and also to thank uh, the people living in Qatar for their solidarity and for their harmony during this crisis. And also, uh, it want to show, you know, the thank to the Emir of Kuwait, Sheikh Sabah Al Ahmed Al Sabah, for his uh, mediation during uh, this uh, crisis, and also for our friends uh, from, you know, different nation who helped in this uh, crisis and this uh, mediation. So I think it's it's a, it's it's time for that speech to say. Qatar is ready for dialogue, but with the respect of the sovereignty of the country and also with not giving orders. Okay. Andreas Craig, let me ask you in London what you thought of the speech. And I guess if there was anything new in there or anything which maybe even the blockading countries may look at and see as a, and I'm using this term very loosely, as a concession. Right. Um, yes, I, I completely agree with uh, was what His Excellency said. Um, it comes at a time when I think we see a de-escalation. I think we see a calming down of, of this entire crisis. We see on both sides people being ready to make concessions and Qatar has been all, all along been ready to negotiate. And But I think I see, especially in Riyadh now, we see a bit of a shift in terms of uh, the approach that they've been taking uh, to Qatar. And I think it's in this kind of context that uh, the Emir had to reach out and had to make clear what the state, what, where his country is standing at this point and uh, what kind of concessions Qatar is willing to make. And I think that um, the, 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 um, the European countries, but particularly the Americans, are very much ready to take this the next step uh, forward. I think uh, Tillerson, the uh, Foreign Secretary of the United States, 
when he was in Doha last week, um, he, was, he made it clear that he wants to engage particularly Saudi Arabia to get them on the side and try to reach an agreement with Saudi Arabia and Qatar, because I think these two countries are the, the most likely to make the concessions and to come to an agreement to at least start talking, you know, make a first step. I think the other countries, quite rightly, I think the Americans realize that especially Egypt and the UAE um, are a lot more, you know, they hold a lot more grudges uh, and they have, they're a lot more ideological about this uh, crisis. And I think for them it will be a lot more difficult to accept the concessions that Qatar is willing to make. Uh, and for Saudi Arabia, they need, they need this to stop. They need a coherent GCC, they need a Korean stance and united front in the GCC. And I think that's why Saudi Arabia probably is quite open to, to start negotiating with Qatar uh, on quite substantiated grounds. Salma Shahada, what do you think about that? I mean, Andreas used the words reaching out there and the idea of starting negotiations further. Was there enough in that speech to move things to that level, do you think? I think so. I think there was a clear articulation that Qatar is willing to engage in dialogue and discussion. There was talk of terrorism, even though the emir said that we've been fighting terrorism not because of the demands of our neighbors, but because it's the right thing to do. And I do think that even though there was a kind of forcefulness to the speech and praise for the Qatari people and residents for dealing with this situation, at the same time, there was the talk of the necessity of GCC coherence and willing to uh, discuss with neighbors and to disagree but nevertheless to work for the interests of the collective good. So I do think this represents a new phase, and I do think it does represent, to some extent, uh, a reaching out, as it were, uh, by Qatar to the other countries involved. And I think that this is the beginning of not only the de-escalation, but possibly finding some kind of a solution to the, to the current crisis. Okay, interesting. Gentlemen, let's pause for a second. Because I want to listen to a little bit more of what Sheikh Tamim had to say. As we mentioned, this was the first speech by the emir since the crisis began. And he actually said as well, further to what our guests have been saying, the time was ripe for dialogue between Qatar and the four blockading nations. Have a listen. I cannot and I do not want to downplay the gravity of the blockade. And I hope that the method and this approach among the brothers will come to an end through dialogue and negotiations. This has been injurious to all the GCC countries and their image worldwide. The time has come for us to spare people from the political differences among their governments. Ambassador Saud, I thought this was an interesting thing which uh, the Emir said, essentially saying this reflects badly on all of us the Gulf as a whole, that this has been bad for everyone. Do you think the blockading countries would see it that way? Well, I think the longer the blockade will continue, the greater the damage for everybody, not only for the Gulf countries, but for everybody. I mean, everybody who have already business or have relation with the Gulf country. Because as we know, as we are aware, that you know, the Gulf country is supplying the energy of 30 or 40 percent of the energy to the world. Qatar is the largest uh, producer of LNG, and a lot of trade is going through the Gulf country to the Far East. So I think this will have, if it is goes more longer, it will have the effect even glo in the global consumers. So it's for the benefit of everybody to end this, you know, to end this blockade and to come to the, you know, to the dialogue and to sit on the table and to solve any differences. Because it's not only economically, unfortunately, the impact, but it's a human rights violation. Mm -hmm. You know, husband or uh, wife is being separated from husband, children is being separated from their mothers, and this will continue to happen. And I think, uh, you know, the, the, the way this crisis happened, uh, it, it went through the wrong process because if you have any differences, like even if a, br a brothers in one house, they have a, uh, you know difference between each other, they will not close doors between each other, but they will sit in a table and they will dialogue. And if you see, this start with uh, you know with uh, attacking and the fake news and this, the whole crisis implemented like this. Although in the Gulf we have already a process of, you know, of solving dispute through the Gulf, uh, you know, uh, Council. And also, if not, this will happen. This can be taken to the UN, uh, you know, um, systems. And imagine in Europe, two countries have dispute between each other. They will not close border. They will sit on the table. They will try to solve it. If not, they will go to Brussels in the European uh, Parliament, and then they will try to solve, uh, you know, their issue from the dispute committee there. So I think 
these should be understood by, by everybody. The only one, I say, the only one benefiting from this kind of crisis and the blockade and the crisis is the, unfortunately, is the terrorists. Unfortunately, is Daesh and uh, Al-Qaeda. And I think it's, it's something that now everybody should realize. The wisdom should be in the table and should to understand that this, you know, is damaging uh, everybody and not only uh, the Gulf country, but also it will damage, you know, it will reach to the global consumer if it goes more longer. Andreas Krieg, um, Ambassador Saud mentioned this there, and in fact, you've all mentioned it to some degree, the idea of negotiations actually happening. But Ambassador Saud is talking about solving disputes through the GCC. I, I don't see how that can really happen when clearly there are divisions within the GCC. And even, uh, you know, the word divorce was used sort of by the, by the Emiratis, the idea of actually the breakup of the GCC. Is it the right forum to be solving this? Well, the GCC was established in the 1980s as a Saudi-led initiative um, at a time when it was about, you know, defeating or kind of creating a common front against Iran. And I think this, uh, to, some, to some extent, the 1980s is a completely different era to where we're in today. And to some extent, this threat that Iran is posing to the region might have changed the nature of this threat. I think the GCC in many ways doesn't have the same kind of impact anymore that it used to have. And um, the problem is, you don't have a common agenda anymore. Different countries have different agendas, and that's something what Sheikh Tamim said yesterday as well. And that's the importance of it. You don't have to have a common policy on every ground. You need to have understanding, and when there are disputes, I completely agree with His Excellency, there are means of trying to solve these disp disputes. But whether the GCC is the right forum to do so, I'm quite skeptical, mm. because nowadays, um, Saudi Arabia doesn't have the kind of leverage anymore. Um, in comparison to the 1980s, Qatar has really evolved as a very important player and so do the, have the UAE. The UAE are a, re, a, a really remarkable player on, on the international, in the inter, international sphere when it comes to their military uh, posture, their economic posture. Um, so really, um, you have three countries here, the UAE, Qatar and Saudi Arabia, who've gone on in, in, into different directions. And now if they don't step away from the idea that the GCC always needs to have a same policy uh, on the same grounds, uh, on the same definition of, the, of, of threat, um, then um, there will not be a there will not be any uh, any, any way of resolve, uh, resolving mm. disputes effectively. And I think when it comes to, for example, to, uh, the term terrorism now is something that all these three countries completely uh, differ on, particularly the UAE and Qatar. For the UAE, terrorism is pretty much any form of dissidence, any form of non-state activity and opposition in countries um, that go against authoritarian rule. And Qatar is, you know, has taken the side of the people in many of these conflicts in the, in the, in the Arab Spring, and they don't see t uh, certain groups that are just trying to to, to do what any opposition party would do in other countries mm. and, and, and blame them as or tarnish them as, as, as terrorism. And I think this is a fundamentally, this is a dispute about a narrative and the narrative about terrorism. And I don't think that in the GCC there is a common narrative now on what terrorism actually means, what support for terrorism actually means. But I do see that the Saudis probably are pretty much are getting closer to the to the sides of the countries because they've been working alongside each other more effectively. The UAE have made it clear already over the last couple of years that they have a very particular approach to terrorism that differs widely from mm. how we in Europe and also the Americans see terrorism. Gentlemen, let's pause again just for a moment. I want to hear from Sheikh Namim again because in his address, the Emir did make it clear, this is to talk about the economy, that Qatar is open for business and that the country is determined to come out of this crisis actually with a strengthened economy. We are open to investment and we will continue to diversify our sources of income and diversify our economy and manufacture all our requirements through our bilateral cooperation with other countries within the region and worldwide based on mutual respect and mutual interests. I have instructed on many occasions to continue to diversify the sources of our economy, yet it is no longer a luxury, it is an obligation. Samar Shahadu with me here in Doha. We've heard this before from this uh, emir. He has talked about diversifying the economy. But you and I both live here. You and I both know that that big skyline 10 minutes down the road from here, that was built on, on oil and gas wealth. It's as simple as that. 
uh, trying to diversify Qatar's economy is, it sounds like the right thing to do, but this is a, this is a big thing to do. And the Emir almost seems to be saying, let's get it done now. Let's get it moving right now. Right. I think certainly the current crisis is, an, is a catalyst for renewed efforts to try to diversify the economy, to try to move to some extent away from hydrocarbons. But again, this is the kind of discourse that we've been hearing in the GCC for the last 30 years. And it's very, very difficult, I think, for these countries with the tremendous wealth that has been produced as a result of hydrocarbons because of their size, as is, as is the case in Qatar, as it were, to actually make significant progress you know, with regard to that. I mean, it's, it's unlikely that Qatar is going to become the new Silicon Valley, mm. <clears throat> as it were, uh, or China in terms of industrial exports. Mm. So it is smart to try to diversify and to try to move beyond hydrocarbons and to try to increase trading partners. At the same time, because of the size of the country, Qatar is never going to produce cars, for example, mm. or other kinds of things. There needs to be a, a, a realism. And I think what was said in the speech that is realistic is a recognition that one cannot kind of live beyond one's means or one cannot live lavishly always, that we need to kind of think about um, making use of the resources we have now for the future mm. in a time post hydrocarbons, if that comes. So that I think was something that will receive increased um, uh, concentration and effort as a result of this crisis. Mm. Ambassador Saud, how do you feel the Qatari population will respond to that call from Sheikh Tamim? Well, uh, I kind, you know, agree uh, in general with your guest in Doha, but I think Qatar through the Vision 2030 already planned to divest its, uh, its economy from hydrocarbonic. Uh, Qatar already launched the, you know, the investment authority, which done a lot of investment outside of, of Qatar. But I think this crisis come with opportunity. You know, every crisis you can get an opportunity from it. And I think the opportunity is Qatar now become more want to depend on it is natural, you know, product. And it is, you know, the product that are produced in Qatar, either it's food or commodities or different type of products. And also diverting or diverse, the diversity of the importing from different uh, nations and different countries. And I think uh, Qatar, in, in a way now, is what His Highness is, is, is speaking about or start, uh, in his speech, I think. He want to encourage the business people to come with a new initiative, with a new ideas, uh, you know, maybe with a knowledge-based economy in a different way. I think maybe depending somehow in some of our natural resources. But I think if there is a different type of, uh, you know, initiatives that can come with the business, in addition, of course, of food security and safety that our Qatar within this crisis will try to depend on itself from the food and uh, you know, uh, from from the food safety and security. But I think it's it's giving us, um, you know, um, uh, you know, a type of opportunity to think more, to look to where are our uh, uh, weaknesses in some of the area and to find solution for these weaknesses and some of them that we need to divest our economy more and more and to think about it more seriously. And I think Qatar already started this for the plan for 2030. Mm -hmm. But I think with this, uh, His Highness's speech, the roadmap, let's say, for the future, it's giving more, you know, um, uh, well for everybody to, to, to come with the new ideas for diverse, uh, you know, the diversity of our economy. Gentlemen, we're starting to run down the clock now, but what I want to do is actually deal with the real nuts and bolts of moving forward because the four blockading countries initially made those 13 demands, didn't they? Things like cutting ties with Iran, even closing Al Jazeera. Qatar promptly dismissed them as an infringement on its sovereignty. So now we have this list of six principles which the Saudi-led group uh, has come up with. And I just wanted to refresh our viewers on, on this. It includes things like a commitment to combat terrorism and prevent its financing, uh, to suspend acts of provocation and speeches inciting hatred, also talking about compliance with the Riyadh Agreement of 2013 and also the outcomes of the Arab Islamic American Summit, which happened again in Riyadh uh, only a couple of months ago. And also um, refraining from interfering in the internal affairs of other states, which I think is what a lot of people might argue these countries are actually doing to Qatar in itself. Now, when I list all of those things off, it's basically all to do with terrorism, financing terrorism, combating terrorism and all these sorts of things. Uh, Andreas Krieg, if I just start with you, Qatar signed this Memorandum of Understanding with the United States, so it is actively doing something, and the US seems okay with that, so that would be the main thing out the way, on the face of it, it would seem. 
you would think. Um, but I think it runs deeper than, it, it goes back to what I said before, the, the clash of narratives over what terrorism is actually, and Qatar disagrees with what the UAE sees as terrorism. Um, but, you know, we, I think we've seen a lot of uh, way now of how Qatar has actually moved forward into that direction. I think everybody in the West is appreciating that. And the Emir made that clear again. The Americans, the Europeans see that the countries have been very cooperative, that actually it's completely blow, blown out of proportion. The, the support that came from Qatar over all these years is very minimal um, in comparison to Saudi Arabia and, and, and other countries in the region. Um, and also, I think uh, Qatar needs to step away from, in general, we all have to step away from the idea of terror finance. Terror finance is absolutely blown out of proportion. We invest millions and millions every year on clamping down on terror finance, while really the big money that these groups make, such as Daesh, Jabal al-Nusra and so on, is through extortion. They, they govern territory. They, 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 they make money locally um, by, sell, by, by, by ripping people off, by selling illicit uh, products and so on and so forth. So mm. terrorism finance from the Gulf is really a minimal topic. And I think Qatar have made a very good choice here to say we actually invest into education. Mm -hmm. Because really what, what we need is counter-narratives, counter-radicalization. And I think Qatar has invested billions and billions in the region and locally in Qatar as well, to change narratives and to change people's minds. And that is what's needed. And plus, I think the Emir also made that very clear, it's, it's about oppression. We need to give people hope. And right. that means we also need to fight against authoritarian oppression. I think, again, there Qatar has been very much leading. Sama, how do you think the terrorism issue gets dealt with? Because, and Andres has made the point very clearly, it is about interpretation of terrorism. And also, if Qatar cuts its ties with any of the groups which the Saudi-led bloc doesn't like, then that's a concession. And that's that's them saying, oh, OK, well, if you say we can't be friends with them, then we won't be friends with them, essentially. Right. Well, you know, as was said before, it's not about terrorism. It's about regime security. The Saudis and the Emiratis have a primary concern with regime security, as all, all regimes do. But they believe that support for political Islam, whether it's the Muslim Brotherhood or other groups, threatens their security, particularly the UAE. The Saudis have their own concerns about Al Jazeera and about freedom of information, about criticism of authoritarian regimes and so on, as well as the not so hostile relations between Qatar and Iran. So these are the real issues that are, that are, that are at play here, not terrorism as it were. And so I agree with the guest in London about different narratives and different understandings of terrorism. I think with regard to the six general principles, another mm. way to look at this is that really Qatar has won. The, the Saudis and the Emiratis thought, I think, in the first few days, because of the overwhelming uh, things that they did, you know, mm. cut diplomatic ties, the blockade and so on, that the outcome would be very different. That Qatar would all of a sudden say, okay, mm. this is too much a for us. And, the 13 and that were, hasn't happened. The 13 were non-negotiable, weren't they, back then? Not only were they non-negotiable, before the 13 demands, there was a list of 59 individuals and organizations that the Emiratis and the Saudis put forward that said, these are terrorists, or these are engaged in terrorist financing, and we want them either extradited or put in jail and so on. So I think one way to be harsh, but nevertheless to read this crisis, is that that it has not succeeded with mm -hmm. regard to the Saudi, Emirati, Egyptian, Bahraini efforts, and Qatar has managed to kind of weather the storm. Ambassador Saud, I'll leave the final word to you. What will Qatar be doing with that list of six principles? Well, I think uh, if I just comment a little bit about Al Jazeera, I think, you know, if we speak about closing Al Jazeera, it's like, you know, asking UK to close the BBC. So it's really ridiculous, I think. And it's, it's, again, it's the freedom of the press. And if we speak about you know, the terrorism or the terrorism allegation, the terrorist allegation, I think it came from no evidence, from no reason. I mean, Qatar have the headquarter of fighting against Daesh is in Qatar. So it, it is really it came with no sense, with no evidence whatsoever. And Qatar have international recognition from the U.S. and from a lot of uh, other allies of whatever Qatar is doing for fighting terrorism. And also, the, you know, the bilateral agreement, which has signed recently, which was negotiated in the last one year with the U.S., which mm. is, you know, concluded in, in the last 10 days. Uh, coming back to the, you know, the six principle, I think came from when the meeting were in Cairo. Uh, Cairo. And I think this six principle, Qatar is implementing this long time ago. It's, it's a six principle that every sovereign state is doing through under the UN regulation, which is not interfering with internal issue with other country uh, to fight against, uh, you know, um, you know, terrorism. Right. And I, uh, I think now is the turn is for the other, uh, you know, countries, the four country is really 
you know, to implement and to, you know, to say that they are also implementing this uh, sixth principle. Uh, if I put my final word, which I stated in the beginning, I think time is now for wisdom. I think uh, Qatar already through his highness yesterday have said it. Qatar is ready from day one to sit on a table and to do dialogue in a, you know, in a, um, a mutual, you know, basis. And I think no, no orders to be given to other countries and no, uh, you know, and to respect other countries, each other's sovereignties. And I think through this, it's the way forward to, you know, to get this crisis uh, solved uh, in, in, in the time. Sheikh Saud bin Abdurrahman Al Thani, I thank you. Also, Andreas Krieg in London and Samar Shehata here in Doha. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching uh, this episode and all our previous ones are online at aljazeera.com. If you want to have a look, the conversations are live and well on social media too. Facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story and on Twitter too at AJ Inside Story or directly to me at Kamal AJE. For now though, from the whole team, thanks for joining us. We'll see you again soon.